everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin, author of The Cryptopians. I started covering crypto seven years ago, and as a senior editor at Forbes, was the first mainstream media reporter to cover cryptocurrency full time. This is the May 5th, 2023 episode of Unchained. Stater Labs is a multi chain liquid staking platform with 40K plus DeFi partnerships across six chains. Soon they'll be coming to Ethereum with their LST ETH X. Visit staterlabs.com slash ETH to sign up for their ETH X alpha list. With the crypto.com app, you can buy, trade, and spend crypto in one place. Download and get $25 with the code LAURA. Link in the description. Ever wanted to use DeFi without being tracked? Railgun is a leading DeFi privacy solution on Ethereum, BSC, Arbitrum, and Polygon. Shield your funds and use them privately in your favorite DeFi apps, while Railgun's cutting-edge zero-knowledge system encrypts your data from public view. Yes, that includes DEX trading. Visit railgun.org or use the Railway app at railway.xyz. Today's guest is Ram Alawalia, CEO and founder of Lumida Wealth. Welcome, Ram. Thanks for having me, Laura. Good to see you again. On April 25th, DCG announced via a statement on Twitter that a subset of Genesis Capital creditors have walked away two months after what they call a comprehensive settlement was submitted to the bankruptcy court. I spoke to a Genesis creditor who is in this group, and they said they felt that this was mischaracterized, that the two sides didn't have an agreement, but just a framework for what a deal could be. This person also said that this framework had been made with limited financial information and that the group revised the terms based on new information and analysis. Either way, Genesis requested a mediator to help resolve the issue. Meanwhile, DCG owes Genesis $630 million next week. So what do all these recent developments mean for Genesis and DCG? Well, it's an unfortunate mess. Uh, so you know, at the outset of the petition, the council are presenting DCG and uh, well, Genesis, as well as the creditors, uh, inform the judge they expect a speedy resolution because they've been working at this. Uh, and this is a step back. There was a term sheet that was published that outlined the key terms of the deal. There was a framework for the deal, as you mentioned. The ad hoc creditor group has pulled back or walked away from that, as you said, due to new information. There's a lot to unpack in what information they learned, as well as still what significant information uh, is outstanding. So how are you looking at all these developments? Like, what do you think is likely to happen at this point, especially given DCG's um, debts to Genesis next week? Do you think it's likely they'll be able to pay them? Uh, I don't believe they'll have the ability to, to make the debt payments. There are uh, $630 million uh, due on dates ranging from my, May 9th, May 10th, and May 11th. $631 million, you know, DCG reportedly paid off the senior credit facility to Eldridge recently. That means they have less cash to meet these obligations. Uh, but we also don't have as much information. We do not have access to the DCG balance sheet. We know that they published financials recently. They've generated more revenue because the price of Bitcoin has increased. However, even the free cash flow one would expect that Grayscale would generate is insufficient to plug the hole. I estimate something like you know, 117 million in cash flow from Grayscale. That's just not enough to to plug a $630 million hole. Here are the other reasons too. You know, you have uh, some reporting that the CFO, Michael Cranes, left. That is a negative sign. That's a red flag. You're also seeing DCG port codes like Luno, their various executive departures. We haven't seen uh, new venture investments from DCG or it stopped entirely. The three ways to plug a, plug a hole, either you generate capital from operations. Again, I don't see enough of that there from Brayscale. Second is you sell assets. There's been no sale of any of these prize jewels of DCG. Third is you do a capital raise. Haven't seen that announced and they haven't done a debt refinancing. So unless we see some announcement reporting around that, I just don't see how they're going to make their debt payment. And so if that's the case, then um, it looks like what a bankruptcy for DCG would also be on the table? Well, they'll attempt to do an out of court workout. It's very similar to what happened when uh, Genesis announced that they're not honoring withdrawals. So there's no imminent bankruptcy. You attempt to do an out of court workout. You attempt to negotiate with the creditors. 
uh, and arrive at favorable terms. But guess what? That's what they have been doing over the last several months. So this is, uh, you know, they, they'll have to continue to negotiate. Uh, and there's a strong interest that creditors have in preserving the ongoing value of DCG and seeking a settlement promptly. It's not of the interest for creditors to hurt the ongoing concern of, of DCG that doesn't help the creditors doesn't help DCG. And so what factors are you looking at to determine like how likely it is that they will end up having to file? Well, let's, let's let things unpack. Let's see what actually happens uh, next week. I think the first thing I'd look for is May 9th. Is that Twitter million loan payment made or not? Um, if that's not made, none of those payments are going to be made. By the way, I don't think you're going to see a scenario where DCG makes partial payments. Either they husband their liquidity or they meet all their obligations. So May 9th is a key date to focus on. You know, let's see what happens there and let's reassess. Also, you know, we don't have access to the contracts and the loan agreements. So we're, you know, making the, the best judgments we can, you know, based on, on publicly available information. I should also say that uh, I'm not a party to any of these transactions. I'm not a creditor of Genesis, I'm not offering financial advice. Uh, I'm simply trying to get a point of view on what this does for the for GBTC, the spreads, the price of Bitcoin, et cetera. So one other wrench that got thrown into the works is that late Wednesday, FTX signaled its intent to try to claw back almost $4 billion in funds from Genesis. How does that affect matters? Right. It's an unfortunate surprise. It's a surprise because, you know, FTX several months ago under John Raines, he had a slide indicating the course of action he would take to seek recoveries. And, and, and the Genesis claim was not on that slide. That's one. Second, it's been a lot of time. Months and months have passed. Of course, the last day to file any claims is the what's called the bar date. That's May 25th. Uh, and so we've seen this claim come in for $3.9 billion. Uh, that does change the recovery, particularly the recovery for uh, Genesis direct creditors. And I think they're in a different position than Gemini Earn. We'll come back to that. However, Genesis can argue the ordinary course of business defense. So that defense is used uh, as a way for creditors to protect themselves from having to return a preferential payment to the debtor. Uh, there are two standards they have to meet to argue for this defense. One is that that payment was made in the ordinary course of the business or the financial affairs of the debtor or creditor. So a margin call would be in the ordinary course of the business operations um, or calling back a loan due to risk management concerns. Uh, and the second thing you have to show that's uh, according to the ordinary business terms. Uh, so it's really a legal analysis question but I would say that you know there's there's credible grounds for Genesis to uh, dispute that that is a legitimate claim. We'll have to see how that plays out, and it may simply be the case that the FTX uh, trustee is seeking to turn over every single rock to maximize their recoveries, even if the probability of recovery is not high. Uh, do you feel then that like Genesis has kind of good arguments to fight that, or? How likely do you think it is that they'll have to? I believe they do. I believe they do have good arguments, spite it. However, it really is a you really need a lawyer that can look at prior settlements and have experience in commercial litigation, has looked at any prior case law that's relevant to this matter. But what I've looked at is what are the two standards? Uh, they seem to be met. At the same time, though, I have not seen those contracts. I have not seen how often uh, Genesis has called in loans. Uh, in the ordinary course in their business. So those facts would matter to that analysis. All right. And then as you mentioned, the Genesis creditor group also includes the Gemini Earn creditors. How did the objectives of these two groups either align or diverge? This is really interesting. This is a breaking news, new development. I hadn't appreciated this before. Happy to share that with you now. First, I think the Gemini Earn creditors have a path to be made whole quickly and promptly as well. And it's worth two reasons. One is the security agreement. So in August of last year, uh, Gemini insisted on a security agreement, and that security was in the form of a GBTC that was pledged uh, to Gemini. And you know that's $62 million in GBTC. So that's one. And the second is uh, Gemini has offered up to $100 million 
if the Gemini urn pool uh, accepts the plan. Now, right now, the plan's up in the air because creditors from the ad hoc uh, guru uh, have walked away. So I do think they have a path to recovery, and that's that's terrific news. However, the uh, direct creditors to Genesis, particularly the top 75 creditors that compromises uh, so-called ad hoc group, uh, they don't benefit from that security agreement. Uh, and they're also not going to benefit from the Gemini urn sweetener that up to $100 million to waive these liabilities in exchange for that. Uh, they are negotiating some other sweetener from DCG. And so these two groups are at odds. Now, the second question that would be like, what's the voting decision making look like? So you need two thirds of the notional debt balances to agree on a deal and a majority of the creditors to agree on the deal. So the top 75 creditors to Genesis, they have about 62% of the votes. So they're not enough to get there. Gemini Earn can swing the vote easily, but the Gemini Earn wants a deal that's on the table today. They want liquidity yesterday. Uh, so there, you know, there's a conflict of interest between those two groups. All right. So in a moment, we're going to unpack this situation between Genesis and DCG a little bit more. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. Meet Stator Labs, the non-custodial multi-chain liquid staking platform transforming the liquid staking landscape. With over $120 million in assets staked and more than 40K users across six chains, Stator has partnered with 40 plus top DeFi protocols like Aave, Balancer, etc. With a unique multi-pool architecture and tokenomics, Ethex, their liquid staking token on Ethereum, empowers stakers everywhere to run a node with as little as four ETH and earn 35% more than solo staking. Sign up for their ETHX alpha list today and be the first to know about $1 million in DeFi rewards. Join over 80 million people using Crypto.com, one of the easiest places to buy, trade, and spend over 250 cryptocurrencies. Spend your crypto anywhere using the Crypto.com Visa card. Get up to 5% cash back instantly, plus 100% rebates for your Netflix and Spotify subscriptions, and zero annual fees. Download the Crypto.com app now and get $25 with the code LAURA. Link in the description. Back to my conversation with Rom. So when you look at what's happening between Genesis and the creditors, who do you feel is like in the right? Or, um, you know, who do you feel will more likely prevail? You know, I think there are a lot of misunderstandings here and there's these asymmetric information problems and the, the game theory is broken is my headline. Okay, let me walk you through that and why these misperceptions have created, you know, this dragging out um, scenario here. So first off, the creditors, particularly the ad hoc creditors are upset because they view these DCG Genesis transactions as not arm's length. Remember that $1.1 billion loan at a 1% interest rate payable in 10 years. It's not arm's length, it's not market terms. And they're correct about that. They also feel that they have uh, evidence of allegations of, of fraud, of accounting fraud and misrepresentation. You recall Cameron Winklevoss uh, said that there was quote unquote unconscionable behavior in December. The other part is that, you know, the, the former CEO of Genesis who, who resigned on the petition of the filing, in the evidentiary hearings, he used the term we to refer to both Genesis and DCG. So people are, you know, creditors are saying like, who are you representing? Are you representing Genesis interests or not? And then the other very odd is the Genesis counsel asked the judge if the DCG loan obligations, you know, the, the May payments due next week could be put in forbearance during the mediation term. So wh why was Genesis counsel advocating DCG's interest? So you can see why that ad hoc credit committee feels aggrieved and upset. However, here's where I think they're making mistakes. One is the, the $1.1 billion loan has essentially allowed these creditors to breach the veil. And these creditors want to breach the veil and go after the DCG mothership, but they've already done that. DCG has, has already offered in the term sheet to restructure the loans, pay a higher interest rate, pay those loans sooner, so you can fast recovery. And the creditors have upside on, on the sale of certain digital assets. 
So there's even a conversion option of debt to BCG equity between 20% to 40%, as well as a path to true board seats on BCG. So in an ordinary bankruptcy, the recourse is limited to the assets of the debtor, in this case, Genesis, right? Genesis is a, a, a limited liability organization, and BCG has already offered up value over and above that. So, you know, I, I think the, the asymmetric information problem is this, like no one has seen the BCG balance sheet. And if you're a creditor from Genesis, you're saying, okay, I know the cash flow from Grayscale. Grayscale is the cash count. Bitcoin's gone up in value. Uh, and why don't we uh, seek recovery on that? And that can happen over time. The problem is that you can't get enough payments soon enough to make the creditors whole. I don't believe that Genesis uh, can be made whole on their May payments. So it's an extraordinary form of bargaining leverage that the creditors have, but putting BCG through uh, a potential default scenario is going to create yet another legal proceeding. So, you know, something like call it 50 to $100 million have been spent on legal fees here. Yeah, I don't think that's in anyone's interest. I think the term sheet that was advanced uh, most recently is quite reasonable. You, you know, it's, it's, it's very unusual, again, to go beyond the estate here. And even if you acknowledge that then perhaps there was some accounting fraud, you know, this isn't the first time investment banks have, uh, have committed in proprietary improprieties. And you don't generally see, 20, 40% of the equity been given to the claimants. There's a settlement. There's a report of something that's neither confirmed nor denied. The parties move on. Um, and you have to deal with the realities of the situation. It's, it's like squeezing blood out of a rock. And it's not in the interest of BCG to publish those balance sheet financials either. So I think this mix of emotion and misperception is, is causing this to drag out. And you know, the lawyers are benefiting uh, and uh, it's it's a really unfortunate situation. And how common is this type of situation between Genesis and the creditors where they kind of seem to come to some sort of an agreement and then things fell apart? You know, it's unfortunate as disappointing and frustrating. Now, recall prior to the petition, the parties were negotiating uh, and they went before a federal judge after the petition day, and they they expect a an expedient resolution. That was one. Second, they published a term sheet, and the term sheet is a framework for the deal. Uh, and then, you know, the ad hoc creditor group, you know, walked away. So the lawyers have a responsibility to lead and manage their clients as well. The emotions are high, the stakes are high, uh, and I, I, I'm disappointed in the lawyers. If you're publishing a term sheet, uh, that should be a bona fide deal. You should not be publishing a term sheet unless you feel like you've got a credible commitment from your client. If you feel like you need to gather more information, then don't publish, you know, the term sheet. Uh, and you know, the legal fees here are significant and that reduces the distributions, the recoveries from the pie, uh, the size of the pie. So it almost feels like you think the creditors should agree to the latest terms. I think it's I think it's a very reasonable term sheet that balances the interests. If you were to tweak one thing, like I think this fundamentally comes down to a lack of trust. BCG has lost trust with that ad hoc creditor committee group. So for those two board seats that are contemplating the term sheet, instead of making those independent board seats. Perhaps those board seats can be appointed by the ad hoc creditor committee group. That might be a way to uh, split the baby and create trust. Now, the, D the DC sheet board is not going to want that. So perhaps what, what the Genesis ad hoc creditor committee can do is advance a slate of potential board candidates, including the creditors themselves or, or not, uh, and then have DCG assess, interview that slate. That might be a path forward to create trust. All right. Well, we will have to see what happens. I think there's um, a big meeting the day this comes out. So I'm sure there's going to be more developments in the next few days. One other thing that I wanted to ask about was the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust 
has been a cash cow for Grayscale, which is um, one of the companies in uh, DCG's portfolio. And it's currently, Grayscale is currently in litigation with the SEC to turn GBTC into a Bitcoin ETF. And if that happens, then that would cut fees for them. So if the judgment is in favor of Grayscale, which at the moment it sort of looks like it will, how does that affect the picture for all of these other proceedings? Yeah, it's it's another monkey wrench. On the on the one hand, you know, you would want Grayscale to prevail in their litigation against the SEC that would unlock the so-called Hotel California. At the same time, one would expect to see significant amount of redemption activity as customers, you know, move to lower cost ETF products uh, that presumably would also be approved on or around the same time. There are something like seven ETFs that are on the docket, including offered potentially by Doug Gemini and, and Van Eck. But what that would mean is that it hurts the cash flow generating power, you know, the number one crown jewel of DCG, uh, and that would hurt the ability of DCG to honor its loan obligations and make creditors whole. And this goes back to the bar point. So if the ad hoc creditor committee group waits another year for another process to unfold, uh, that creates more risk on recovery. Grayscale is a melting ice cube. It melts right now at a 2% rate per year. That's the fees are extracted from the trust and there's no more Bitcoin getting pledged in the trust and it's got a discount and AV. But if that ETF is approved, that melting ice cube's got a hot hair dryer blowing over it. It's going to melt very rapidly and that's the cash flow generating power. Uh, so you know, they really need to move to expedient resolution uh, swiftly. And the other side of this is from Barry's perspective. On the one hand, the higher the price of Bitcoin, the greater the cash flow generating power of Grayscale and to make these credits whole. On the other hand, it means that uh, DCG has to pay out more next week. So that last payment, that May 11th payment, DCG is short 4,550 Bitcoin. So the amount owed on that last date has gone up from where it was in December, like 68 million to now, it's like hard 30 million. So it's a really odd situation for uh, DCG where in a way they have to hope that the Bitcoin price drops next week and then shoots up, you know, sometime after that. Okay. And um, one last thing is, so we're watching for the May 9th date, what happens on that date. Um, we're also watching for the Bitcoin price. Um, what else would you advise people to watch for in the next week to see how this might all play out? So there are a few things. One is there was an independent investigation commissioned by the uh, Genesis Special Committee. Uh, they retained Cleary Gottlieb, a former U.S. Southern Restrictive Attorney. These are the best. These are the baddest attorneys out there. And they were going to investigate the pre-partition transactions and you know other allegations. Uh, we haven't seen any findings or report of that. Now, in the docket, it was indicated that at a summary report will be made available to the public. I have not seen that. I'd like to see that. Perhaps some of the findings from that report is the reason why the ad hoc credit committee has pulled back. I have no insight into that. Public doesn't have insight into that. Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second is DCG. You know, the number of questions there, no one has seen the DCG balance sheet. And they're looking at top spot. If they re release the balance sheet, it can make their situation perhaps more challenging uh, in terms of their negotiation. Uh, the other part I'd want to know is like, what is the net equity position of DCG? Uh, and is that the reason why they may not have been able to refinance their loans or obtain an equity infusion, notwithstanding these, the threat of litigation and other lawsuits flying around? You know, and the reason I call that out is. You know, in August, uh, DCG pledged GBTC to Gemini Earn. Good move, Gemini Earn, for securing that collateral, as I mentioned. However, uh, on November 16th, that collateral was foreclosed upon and liquidated. Uh, and that could have caused an impairment to the DCG balance sheet. So I'd want to understand, like, what is the net equity position of DCG? I'd also want to understand uh, what GBTC is held unencumbered, meaning not pledged to Gemini Earn, and what's the value of that DCG balance sheet. In the end of Q4 financials, DCG 
uh, and Coinbase reported some very summary statistics. They said there's something like six hundred million dollars in the investment portfolio. Uh, what percentage of that is illiquid venture? What percentage of that is liquid securities? We need that to get a definitive analysis on the ability for uh, DCG ge to generate its uh, uh, liquidity and meet its obligations. So, I think those are the main ideas that you know you want you want to look out for. And so, if they make like partial payment next week, what happens? Is is that not a thing or? Well, I think it makes sense to make a partial payment. Uh, if they make a partial payment, then they're not much cash flow. There's a reason they're making the partial payment. Either you pay off all your bills on time, when due, uh, or you don't pay any of them. Uh, and I think we'll we'll learn which state of the world we're in on on May night. Now, again, um, I don't have access to the terms. I don't see what the consequences of not paying these are. You know, these are uh, well negotiated agreements. So um, I expect that the consequences would be severe for non-payment. Well, what happens if you don't pay? You you're in a, you get kicked out to an out-of-court workout. So I'm in the same position they are in today, in a sense, of negotiating. The question would be, would any of the creditors seek to pressure BCG by filing an involuntary petition for Chapter 11? Right? It only takes three creditors to perform that action. Yeah, you know, so you know, BCG could be in a tough spot. You know, another way to look at this is, BCG has their own duration mismatch. And Laura, you know, I've talked about this in various podcasts before, where BCG has this asset called Grayscale and this other asset called Boundary and Luna and, and Blue and Coindesk. They generate cash. They generate cash flow over time. Uh, and BCG does not have the time. They have these payments that are due next week. And the way generally you solve these duration mismatches, you get financing for that cash flow and for that asset. We have not seen a point of that. The CFO left. So, uh, you know, not a good sign. I think things to look for in the markets would be, I would expect the spread for GBTC to widen. I would expect that the digital assets that uh, DCG uh, owns on its balance sheet, I would expect that those assets, you know, sell off because the market may expect forced selling from DCG. Uh, and we saw some of that in November, December. However, uh, you know, we don't know if DCG chooses not to pay the May payments, you know, they, they might not actually sell those assets. So we'll see how things unfold and, you know, they'll be ahead. And, and just to be clear about what you're saying there, you are saying that perhaps Grayscale might sell the Bitcoin in GBTC? Well, so DCG, it would be DCG. Grayscale won't sell anything. Grayscale is a fine business. They're litigating the SEC. They're, you know, seeking to convert to an ETF. But DCG, in the run-up to the three years capital collapse, they acquired seven or sixty million dollars worth of GBTC on leverage from Ge Genesis subsidiary. Now, a good chunk of that is already been pledged to Gemini Air. However, their strong unencumbered component, meaning it has not been pledged, it is on the DCG balance sheet, and that is a source of liquidity for DCG. DCG can sell that to generate proceeds to pay some portion of the $630 million loan. Not enough, based on my analysis. Uh, but, you know, if if DCG does need to sell that, then you'd expect a slippage. You'd expect to see market impact. You remember uh, in November, uh, it was reported that Gemini, in November 16th, when they foreclosed on the collateral, they uh, did a block sale on GPTC, and it did create a market impact. Uh, and you know, uh, DCG has to make a decision on whether or not they want to sell those assets. And we also don't know, do they already sell those assets? Now, based on the most recent 10Q filing from Grayscale, it does appear to be the case that DCG or Genesis still has a material amount of GBTC on the balance sheet, something like two hundred forty million dollars plus or minus uh, on the balance sheet. All right. Well, this is clearly a very, very sticky and entangled situation. Thank you so much for unpacking it all. Thanks for having. Me. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Don't forget. Next up is the weekly news recap. Stick around for this week in crypto after this short break. Ever wanted to use DeFi without being tracked? Railgun is the leading DeFi privacy solution on Ethereum. 
It's available on BSC, Arbitrum, and Polygon 2. Shield your funds and use them privately in your favorite DeFi apps, while Railgun's cutting-edge zero-knowledge system encrypts your data from public view, all without leaving your preferred chain. Yes, that includes DEX trading. Coming soon are integrations with leading yield, lending, and perp trading platforms on multiple chains. DeFi and privacy, together at last. Visit railgun.org or use the Railway app at railway.xyz to find out more. Thanks for tuning in to this week's news recap. White House proposes crypto mining tax. The Biden administration is pushing for a tax on crypto miners equal to 30% of their energy costs. The purpose is to cover the, quote, harms they impose on society, according to the White House's Council of Economic Advisors. The digital asset mining energy tax could generate up to $3.5 billion in revenue over the next decade, but Republican opposition may hinder its progress. Nick Carter, founder of Castle Island Ventures, tweeted, I know politicians focus only on first-order effects, but it bears repeating, for the nth time, discouraging mining in the U.S. would directly increase emissions associated with Bitcoin mining. In other news, Bhutan's investment arm, Druk Holding & Investments, and Jihan Wu's BitDeer Technologies plan to jointly raise up to $500 million for a crypto mining fund. Ujwal Deep Dahal, CEO of DHI, stated the partnership aims to create a, quote, carbon-free digital asset mining data center and foster a, quote, sustainable domestic economy in Bhutan. As the U.S. tightens regulations on the crypto industry, the Blockchain Association, a crypto advocacy group, is shifting resources out of New York State to focus on federal policy in Washington, D.C. This decision follows New York Governor Kathy Hochul's signing of a law banning fossil fuel-powered cryptocurrency mining in the state making it the first state in the U.S. to do so. Coinbase succeeds expectations in Q1, but faces legal issues. Coinbase outperformed analysts' expectations in the first quarter of 2023, reporting revenues of $772.5 million, significantly surpassing the estimated $653.84 million in revenues. Despite slightly lower trading volumes, transaction revenue also exceeded forecasts, reaching $374.7 million against an expected $318.5 million, highlighting continued growth in the crypto exchange market. Quote, we are pleased with the pace of innovation and the results we are seeing, said the exchange on Twitter. The stock was up 8% following the earnings release. Despite that good news, earlier in the week, Coinbase faced two legal complaints. The first one alleged the violation of Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act during its Know Your Customer checks. It claims that Coinbase's KYC procedures are, quote, unlawful due to the lack of user protection against identity theft. The second accuses its top executives of making over $1 billion through Coinbase's direct listing by not disclosing, before the company's shares went public, negative information, such as that the company's revenue was being compressed or that it planned to do an additional $1.25 billion private sale in new convertible notes that would dilute existing shareholders. Coinbase denies both allegations, calling them, quote, frivolous and meritless. In other news, Coinbase announced the launch of the Coinbase International Exchange, allowing international users to trade perpetual futures out of Bermuda. The platform will initially offer Bitcoin and Ether derivatives with 5x leverage, with more listings planned for the future. This move comes amid a bitter dispute between Coinbase and U.S. regulators as the company seeks to compete with other crypto exchanges in the offshore derivatives market. Economist and crypto analyst Alex Kruger tweeted, U.S. regulators are succeeding in pushing crypto abroad. Surprising revelations about crypto bank Protigo Trust's denied application. A recent investigative report by New York Mag's Jen Vietchner has unveiled new information about crypto bank Protigo Trust's application with the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the U.S.'s chief bank regulator, which had previously been denied. Valued at $2 billion, Protigo had received conditional approval in 2021 and raised over $100 million from major crypto companies, including Coinbase. An anonymous source familiar with the matter has now revealed that the denial was due to a technicality that the regulator had never before mentioned to Protego. Despite securing the necessary funding before the deadline, the OCC stated that the reason for denial was that the funds were not physically in the bank, 
However, Protico was previously informed that the money transfer was required only four days before the official opening. Protico founder Greg Gilman said, quote, We courted regulation. We did everything that was required. In the end, it feels like there was an unannounced and unexplained policy change that derailed our efforts. This situation, along with others, seems to be another data point that the theory that there's a coordinated effort to cut the crypto industry off from the banking sector, which is dubbed Operation Chokepoint 2.0, has merit. Former OpenSea executive found guilty of insider trading. In a groundbreaking verdict, Nate Chastain, ex-head of product at non-fungible token or NFT platform OpenSea, has been convicted of money laundering and wire fraud in a federal court in New York. Chastain was accused of profiting from insider knowledge, making over $50,000 between June and September of 2021 by purchasing NFTs he knew would be featured on OpenSea's homepage. He would then sell them after their prices had jumped. To cover his tracks, Chastain had used anonymous wallets and accounts. U.S. Attorney Damian Williams stated, quote, Nathaniel Chastain exploited his advanced knowledge of which NFTs would be featured on OpenSea's website to make profitable trades for himself. Williams emphasized that despite the case involving digital assets, Chastain's actions were nothing more than fraud. Prosecutors filed charges against Chastain in June of 2022, marking the first insider trading case involving digital assets. Chastain now faces up to 40 years in prison. Celsius founder fights New York fraud allegations. Former Celsius Network CEO Alex Mashinsky has filed a motion to dismiss the New York State complaint against him, which alleges securities fraud and accuses Mashinsky of making false and misleading statements about the safety of assets deposited with Celsius. In his response, Mashinsky argues that the crypto products offered by Celsius were neither securities nor commodities and blames the company's failure on other forces, such as the Terra USD stablecoin collapse. Meanwhile, Celsius and its creditors are seeking to merge its UK and UK entities, alleging that the distinction between the two was a, quote, sham and resulted in billions of dollars being fraudulently transferred between them. The company argues that the two entities should be treated as one for bankruptcy purposes, which could prove crucial to recoveries for customers and Series B investors. Poloniex settles sanctions charges. Crypto exchange Poloniex has agreed to pay a $7.5 million fine to settle a civil liability lawsuit concerning apparent sanctions violations. The U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control alleged that Poloniex allowed customers from Crimea, Cuba, Iran, Sudan, and Syria to trade $15 million worth of digital assets on its platform between January 2014 and November 2019. If you want to learn more about this, read my book, The Cryptopians. In a statement, the department emphasized that all financial services providers, including online digital asset companies, are responsible for ensuring compliance with OFAC sanctions. Layer 1 Blockchain SUI launches mainnet. SUI, a Layer 1 blockchain developed by Mistin Labs, launched its mainnet on Wednesday. Here's Unchained reporter Sam Sriram reporting the news from a video we released that day. SUI is a designated proof-of-stake blockchain that runs on a modified version of Move, a Rust-based programming language that was created by developers working on Meta's DM blockchain initiative. The project was actually founded by four former Meta engineers who created the entity behind the blockchain Mistin Labs in 2021. So far, the firm has raised $336 million over the course of two funding rounds and is valued at $2 billion. Blockchain boasts a peak throughput of 297,000 transactions per second and a network of 100 globally distributed validators. The scope for this high-speed blockchain to run a new range of decentralized applications is perhaps one of the reasons why it has garnered immense support from the crypto community. Justin Sun reverses multi-million dollar transfer after warning from CZ. Tron founder Justin Sun has reversed a $56 million true USD transfer to Binance's launch pool after getting called out by Binance CEO Chengpeng Zhao. The significant transfer raised concerns that it would be used to buy up large amounts of SUI tokens, which are meant to be airdrops for retail users rather than concentrated amongst a few whales, according to CZ. In response, Sun explained that the funds were inadvertently transferred by team members who were unaware of their intended purpose and that their primary objective was to enhance liquidity and trading volume between leading TUSD exchanges. Binance later confirmed the refund and reallocation of the 278,752 farmed SUI tokens to its TUSD liquidity pool. Blur unveils new protocol for NFTs. 
On Tuesday, NFT marketplace Blur launched a new protocol dubbed Blend to boost liquidity for NFTs. I interviewed the company founder, Tishan Roker, who goes by Pac-Man. Here's what he said. Why is it that Blur decided to launch NFT borrowing? Right now in NFTs, there's pretty much no financialization. So, you know, there's billions of dollars worth of NFTs trading every month, but there's absolutely no, you know, pretty much zero financialization at all. If you look at most financialized markets, like the housing market or the crypto market, you know, every big market grows through financialization. So even if you look at like Bitcoin, for example, 90% uh, of Bitcoin volume is from derivative volume. It's not from, you know, spot volume. Similarly, in the housing market, it's, you know, the majority when people buy their houses, they buy it with a mortgage. They don't pay all the money up front. And NFTs today, we're still at the very early stage of this market where there isn't any sort of financialization. Dubai regulator reprimands 3AC founders. Dubai's Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority has issued a written reprimand to 3 Arrows Capital co-founders Su Zhu and Kyle Davies, along with three others, for operating and promoting their new digital asset exchange, OPNX, without the required local license. The regulator stated it will continue investigating OPNX's activities to determine if further corrective measures are needed. The exchange, which launched last month, has been offering virtual asset exchange services without proper regulatory licenses, according to a statement from the regulator. Balaji Srinivasan closes Bitcoin bet early. Former Coinbase CTO Balaji Srinivasan has prematurely settled his bet that Bitcoin would reach $1 million within 90 days, donating a total of $1.5 million to three different organizations. Srinivasan made the bet after consecutive bank failures in March, predicting the U.S. dollar's collapse and hyperinflation would propel Bitcoin's value. The bet was closed with mutual agreement and Srinivasan donated $500,000 in USDC to Chaincode Labs, GiveDirectly, and Twitter user James Medlock. The entrepreneur said, quote, I burned a million to tell you they are printing trillions, referring to the Federal Reserve led by Jerome Powell, which this week raised interest rates by 25 basis points one more time. Time for fun bits. PayPal announces that Venmo users will be allowed to trade crypto. Unchained's Jenny Hogan gives her take on this news. So PayPal has announced that it's going to let users begin trading crypto on Venmo. Why is PayPal allowed to do this? Well, because they own Venmo. Decentralized icons for the win. Given the number of people who think crypto is a scam, I do love the idea of being able to passive aggressively send money to someone. I feel like this is going to be huge on first dates. Like, hey, have some of this money you don't believe in. But it could be big. I mean, 74% of Venmo customers have held crypto in their accounts for the last year. To be fair, the last year hasn't been a great time to sell crypto, but Venmo is going to cap crypto coin purchases at $50,000 a year annually. This is intended to ensure responsible trading, risk management, and to limit the number of tweets that start with, I lost my life savings trading crypto on Venmo, a thread. Venmo is in many ways the perfect place for crypto since you can't make a Venmo transaction without saying what the transaction is for. And no one should buy cryptocurrency without being able to explain why. Like, don't try Dogecoin until you're absolutely sure that therapy is not going to work. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about ROM, Genesis's negotiation with creditors, and how all this affects DCG, check out the show notes for this episode. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Kevin Fuchs, Matt Pilchard, Zach Seward, Juan Aranovich, Sam Sriram, Jenny Hogan, Jeff Benson, Leandro Camino, Pema Jimdar, and Shashank. Thanks for listening.